I'm the organizer of uh, Rare Disease Day. First of all, thanks very much to Professor Paul Hogg uh, for this welcome uh, introduction uh, to our day. Uh, we hope you will enjoy the day. As he said, there is a variety of activities uh, set out for you. And without any further ado, because as you know, we have started a little late because of traffic, uh, I will get introduced. Rare Disease Day uh, every day has, has a theme, uh, and this year is patient voice. Join us in making the voice of rare diseases heard. So wha what, what is Rare Disease Day? Where, why are we here today? Uh, rare Disease Day takes place on the last day of February each year, and, and the reason for that is that every four years is a leap year, and you have the 29th, like uh, this year in particular. So it's a rare thing, and that's the reason why this particular day was chosen as a rare disease day. The main objective of the day is to raise awareness among the general public, the clinical community, and in general, really everyone, about rare diseases and their impact on patients' lives. And as you can see there, the campaign targets a number of, a number of groups. But why are these diseases important? Why, why are they something we should care about? Well, there is actually a technical definition of what a rare disease is. It's one that affects fewer than one in 2,000 people. Uh, common diseases will affect perhaps one in three, one in four, if you think of cardiovascular disease, cancer, put it in context, fewer than one in 2,000. It's relatively few people, they are rare. But the issue is that there are between six and 8,000 rare diseases. So if you put all those together, all in all, they'll affect 6% of people at some stage in their lives. 6% of people means that in each of your schools, there will be people affected by rare diseases. That if you live in an average size road, there will be someone on your road affected by a rare disease. In addition to that, they take a disproportionate part of the health budget, 20% versus 6% 6 of people affected. And the reason for that is that we really have very few cures for those people. For most of them, all that can be offered is palliative treatment. We can look after their symptoms, but not, nothing else. And this is very expensive. Additionally, 75% of rare diseases affect children and 30% of those will die before uh, their fifth birthday. But really, most of us just don't know about this. So uh, one of the goals of the day is to raise awareness about all this. Just to try to give you an idea of what 7,000, 6 to 8,000 rare diseases are. There is a list of them in alphabetical order. These are, these are the first 10 of those diseases. So. Anyone wants to make a guess of how long it would take me just to read the list of rare diseases? If I could actually manage to read down a list with those awful names uh, non-stop, I, I guess. Go on, just throw, throw a number. How many hours may it take me to read a list of rare diseases? Two hours. Two hours. Any more guesses? Sorry? One day, okay. Any more? Any more? One month. One month, okay. No, it's actually in between the first two. It would take me 12 hours just to read the list. To actually find a cure for any one of those diseases may take someone many years, or the, co the scientific community many years. As I say, for most of them, we don't have actually cures at the moment. So just, I hope that it's, this conveys a little bit the, the task ahead. It's, it's pretty massive. So why are we interested in showcasing this at, at Royal Holloway? Well, 80% of those rare diseases are inherited, are passed on from parents to children. And for many of those, perhaps we can offer a genetic or a stem cell cure. And Holloway has an international reputation in this particular field of regenerative medicine. So we are very keen to showcase our research and teaching in this, in this area. These are the people here at Royal Holloway uh, who are involved in this gene and stem cell therapy area. And today you are actually going to hear, apart from myself giving you an introduction, 
from Dr. Philip Chen talking about motor neuron disease and Professor George Dixon who will talk to you about uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy mostly. Between all of us, we cover a small number of rare diseases uh, listed here, uh, which as you can see are literally a very, very small proportion of those 7,000 rare diseases that there are. But it's, everything is important, and the important thing really is to ensure that more and more people become involved in this, and that's the, the awareness part of the day that we were quoting. These are really exciting times uh, in, in the research arena, and I hope you will hear about some of these uh, developments during the day. Now we can do something called genome editing. We can actually repair the genome, introduce specific changes that can have a therapeutic effect and perhaps uh, provide a cure. And, and we have stem cell developments, as again you may hear about today, that can pot potentially provide cures for those diseases. So in terms of, of research and potential cures, it's a really exciting time. So you have heard what you are going to be doing regarding lectures today, who you are going to hear from. Uh, after that, we will have an exhibition uh, in the Windsor building that you will be visiting. You will have a lab activity in our uh, School of Biological Sciences uh, labs. And in the afternoon, you will have a speed dating uh, time in which you will meet groups of our undergraduates to discuss everything from rare diseases to uh, life in college. And you will have a bioart activity exploring a particular uh, rare disease uh, producing a, a poster. All this will be possible because a lot of undergraduate and postgraduate volunteers from college are helping to run this day. You will have seen some of them today already wearing orange t-shirts this year, and these are the groups uh, who in past years, loads of them, uh, only one of one, a few of them are pictured here, have supported the day. We consider this, and we hope they really, we know actually that they very much enjoy it, this is an enrichment activity for them. Uh, so, you know, talk to them. Try to try to make the most of that possibility of interaction with our school students, uh, uh, both undergraduates, postgraduates, uh, and PhDs. So coming back at why you are here today, I hope you can just about see the outline of a metaphase spread in which a particular gene in a in a chromosome is highlighted in in green. And you know, those, that's one gene just highlighted uh, out of maybe 25,000 or, or 30,000. Just to recap, even though I know, uh, or I'm sure you know this, genes store the information to make proteins. So if you have a normal gene, you will have a normal protein. But if the gene is mutated, uh, and that mutation is represented here with that green blob, Perhaps that gene will produce an abnormal protein or will produce no protein at all. So are all those mutations really bad? Uh, well, not really. Uh, some are irrelevant. We are lucky that the function of that particular gene can be covered by another one. Or some have a minor effect, you know, some, something that is not troubling you very much. Uh, and evolution is based on the presence of mutation, so that obviously is a, is a beneficial effect. But that is not always the case, and some mutations lead to tremendous uh, effects. And this, a this is a particular disease that we work with in my lab called spinal muscular atrophy that can have a devastating effect. In, in the most severe cases, uh, children die by the age of two or so. Uh, and in the least severe cases, you can still see that there is severe disability uh, associated to this. This is for the patients, but also this is tragic for the families because when a family uh, has a case of a rare disease, in many cases, someone actually has to stop working to look after the child affected by a rare disease. And in some cases, that has a a devastating effect on the family. It really is difficult to convey the pressure that something like that can have on, on the family. And some of you may recall a tragic case two years back uh, here uh, in London. <coughs> so, you know, I've, I've given you perhaps a grim picture. So is, is there hope here? Well, yes, there is. 
Uh, there are successes in a number of gene therapy clinical trials for, rare, for diseases, some of which you may have heard of and others that probably you haven't. Uh, there is finally a first uh, medicinal product based on gene therapy available in the European Union. It's called Glybera for that particular disease, lipoprotein lipase deficiency. And there is an international rare disease research consortium with uh, ambitious goals. I'll come back to that in a minute. I just want to make the point that that particular medicinal product is actually an engineered virus that is used to transfer the defective gene or an, a working copy of that gene into patients. That's the kind of medicine that one can do these days. Adapt a virus to deliver a gene to affect a cure. In terms of politics, uh, there is a realization that this is important. There is a Euro plan, and rare diseases are a priority area for the EU. In the UK, the Royal College of General Practitioners made rare diseases a clinical priority with a particular focus on motor neuron disease, which is the disease Dr. Philip Chen is going to be talking to you uh, in a few minutes. And there is a UK strategy for rare diseases published in November 2013. Unfortunately, uh, while from that UK strategy, a number of uh, UK nations have produced a plan for implementation of the strategy, in England that is still lagging behind. In England, we don't yet have a plan for implementation of this UK strategy. Uh, so at least there is some hope at the political uh, front. But is it all good? Well, not, not really. Uh, one particular issue is that the genetic therapies that are being developed have a tremendous price tag. It can be in the region of a million pounds or a million euro for, for a therapy of this, uh, of this type. And paying for that through the NHS is obviously a very big issue when you consider how many rare diseases there are. And also, drugs that were originally used for something else, if they have a therapeutic effect in rare disease uh, and get the designation of, uh, of orphan drugs, have become much more expensive. So obviously that is not positive. And as we have discussed, we have limited therapeutics for these diseases. So a particular example is, I've told you that there are between six and 8,000 rare diseases but uh, there is a much smaller number of diseases screened for in newborns. I guess that many of you will have heard of the UK newborn screening program for rare diseases in which a, a, a blood drop is taken from children uh, aged five days and they are screened for a number of diseases. Do anyone wants to make, does anyone want to make a, a guess about how many diseases are screened for through this program? Go on, throw in a number. Six to eight thousand rare diseases. So how many do we screen for in the UK? Two hundred. Any more guesses? Go on, throw a number. Seven hundred. Actually, it's nine. <laughs> yeah? Out? No, no, thank, thank you for guessing. It's, this is the point, really, that we screen for nine out of six to eight thousand. So on balance, uh, basically the government, because these are government programs, considers that in terms of benefit for the patient and cost effectiveness, only currently nine are worth screening for. Just gives you an idea of how much work to be done. I've told you that there is an international uh, rare disease research consortium with very ambitious goals uh, to develop 200 new therapies by 2020 and to have diagnostic tests for all rare diseases by 2020. This is where we are as of yesterday, 158 uh, new therapies out of the 200 goal. And just uh, enlarging that particular plot, there are diagnostic tests for in the region of 3,600 rare diseases currently. So progress there is. Yeah. And just to wrap up my talk, uh, what I want I've shown you, hopefully, uh, the importance of rare diseases, how tragic they can be, but there are positive takes here as well. People affected by rare diseases are tremendously inspirational. Uh, this is Srin Madipali, who is affected by spinal muscular atrophy, and in past years he was one of our speakers. 
His friend will do anything. He's been there. I haven't been there. He's been up in the mountains. He's done everything to degrees. You know, this, this is people who just will get on with life. And another example, Helene Rainsford, who was a, a master's student here. She was our patron in uh, 2012. And she's a Paralympic gold medalist in rowing. So as I say, these are tremendously inspirational people. To put something like this together, many people are involved. Uh, so our thanks go to, in general, our School of Biological Sciences and a number of professional services at college, research and enterprise, student recruitment, communications. But at the end of the day, it's the people uh, who make the difference. So many thanks to our staff, postgrads, and undergrads, our exhibitors in the Windsor Building, and our speakers today. And finally, thank you, because I know that there are many different things you could be doing here rather than listening to me. Uh, so we appreciate that. But obviously, most of you are underage, so you should forget <laughs> all those things.